Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. Sponsored this week by A Better Root Planner. They've had over 7 million roots planned. Yeah, I was using it just the other day just to be like, where can I go? What can I do? Turns out I can go and do anything I want because with Better Root Planner, it's anywhere. And sponsored by Ecoware.us. We've got new designs every week. In fact, Jesse's wearing a new one. Mm-hmm. And I'm wearing the same one, but on a hat. Check that out. Nice. We offset every order through the manufacturer and shipping through the life of your product. And we plant a tree for every order. So it's carbon negative. That's right. All right. So I thought we'd start this in depth with uh, a statement by a senior official at VW. Kind of surprised me this week. Okay. Uh, it was Reinhard Fischer. He's a senior vice president for Volkswagen Group and the head of strategy for the VW brand in North America. And he made this comment to Automotive News at the 2019 Car Management Briefing Seminars in Michigan. He said, once you overcome the fear of something new, the EV is the better choice for you. I don't think it's going to take a lot of convincing. There is a fundamental curiosity. Everybody sees the end state. When you put pencil to paper, owning a full electric vehicle costs about half of what a gas car costs me to operate. And I was like, wow. Right. Who just said that? You know, we've heard a lot of, of car manufacturers and people from car manufacturers saying like, EVs, they're blah, blah, blah. You know, they're never going to be viable. People will never drive them because they're it's too scary. The range anxiety and everything like that. And it's nice to hear someone who's actually talking about like overcoming the fear and that it's a fundamentally better experience. I mean, he just says fundamental curiosity, but I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Let's, let's keep going. All right. He said, there is still a fear about driving electric cars through water. For 50 years, we've educated people that electricity and water don't mix. So that's interesting that hmm. in their focus groups, that's one of the number one things they've been hearing, which I kind of think is, I don't know. I haven't heard that a whole lot. I actually was driving home yesterday in the rain, crazy thunderstorms we were having. And, and you got electrocuted? No, on the highway, I went through a puddle like seven eight inches deep it was crazy and the people i was driving in the car with were like oh my god i we, we went through it and we were okay and i'm like <laughs> yeah they thought of it you know they they did their research they yeah. did the engineering work to make sure that we would live through a puddle. I think that it goes back to this idea of like safety and you learn it when you're really young. So it like is way in there of just like water, electricity, bad. Right. Whoa, charging. <laughs> Careful, it's raining outside, Jesse. Don't electrocute yourself. He went on to say range anxiety has now been replaced by charging anxiety. A hundred years ago, gasoline was sold at pharmacies. Today, we have 122,000 gas stations in the United States. It's transformed from a bottleneck to a commodity. Electric charging is going to be exactly the same. Wow. And I was like, Finally, does this guy work for Tesla? Who does he work this for? Is, this is a nice, enlightened statement. And he's actually true. You know, you went from the Leaf, I, or at least I went from the Leaf, driving with about 90 miles of range on a really good day, driving really conservatively to my Tesla where I can get easily 250 miles. So it's no longer that the range is the anxiety, it is the charging that is the part where you're like, ooh, am I gonna have a place to charge when I get there? And you know, with Tesla, I think it's been solved with the superchargers, but I think that with other electric cars, it's just this like, is there a charger there and will it be available for sure. Right. And then lastly, he said, we strongly believe that the tipping point is near and that tipping point will be price equity. And so when I read that, I was like, this is great. They understand that we are getting to price equity between EVs and ICE cars. And wow, VW gets it. Yeah, but he didn't say that it's, he didn't give it time. He just said it is near. And that's true because as I did some more research into VW, um, they are currently investing billions in order to change their all electric car production capacity from a few thousand units per year to two to three million all electric cars a year by 2025. And that sounds really good when you first hear it because mm -hmm. it's got the word million in there. So you're like two to three million. Right. But then when you realize that the year 2025 is six years away and that two to three million is what Tesla is going to be making easily by that time, right. then you go... So basically, your plan is to be doing what Tesla will be doing in five or six years. And this isn't anywhere near the production capacity of Volkswagen today. I mean, it's not like two to three million cars a year is like a difficult number for them to hit. They're making about 10 million cars a year. So I mean, two to three million is like a quarter to a third of their total production, which means that, you know, 
75 to 60 percent is still going to be gas burning cars that's that's how i read it and this is how i think vw thinks they look at tesla and they're like well they've got one factory in california and half a factory in china in 2025 they'll have a factory in california and maybe a factory in china Right. So we'll be ahead of them. And it's like, no, the rate they're growing, they're going to have factories all over the place. Right. They'll probably have some of your factories. And I think that the fundamental thing here is that they don't really mean what they say when they say these things, when they say that they want to switch to electric cars. It's kind of like when you were a kid and your mom would say, go clean your room. At, at one point when you were a kid, you were probably like five or six and you'd learn the word no. And you were like, I'm going to try this one out. Right. And so... Your mom says, okay, go clean your room. And you went, no. And maybe that worked that one time because you threw a hissy fit or something. But eventually your mom was like, no, you're going to go clean your room. No isn't going to work on me. So then time passes and eventually you're like, oh, I've learned this new trick. It's called soon. And so your mom says, go clean your room. And you say, oh, I will soon. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to clean my room and I will clean my room but not at this very moment. And so your mom, who's used to hearing no, hears soon and goes, oh, great, and goes off of, uh, you know, about her business. But this soon, this like, oh, I will. Oh, it's, I'm going to do it. That is where they are currently at. They're currently at probably, I don't know what age. I think it depends a lot on your development. But, you know, maybe like 10, yeah. 11 maybe if you're a boy. Maybe if you're a girl, I don't know what happens if you're a girl. I, I think it lasts well into teenagerhood. Yeah. But. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, there's no strategy beyond I will. Right. Um, because, I mean, the only other option is that, like, oh, I'm, I'm doing it right now, Mom. Cleaning. Wow. You wouldn't believe how clean it's getting in here. Wow. And so this is exactly what, what all these car manufacturers are doing. They're playing this game, this slow game, where first they tell us, no, you don't. You don't want electric cars. Electric cars are never coming. Then they go, they're coming soon. Real soon. Really. Right? And you're like, oh, great. They're coming soon. I guess I don't need to worry about it. I don't right. need to keep calling them or whatever. Because they're doing it soon. And then soon we're going to get pretty fed up with that. And so they keep coming out with these little commercials, these little ads where they're like, look, we're doing it. It's here. Or it's coming soon. Or we're doing it now. Um, and it's like... No. Even though the message is positive, even though it's like, EVs are coming, they're coming soon, we think that they're going to match price parity very soon, and that means that everyone's going to get an electric car. That sounds great. And they have actually invested some money into doing that. They've invested billions of dollars, which sounds great, but honestly, $5 billion for a gigafactory, and the world needs about 100 right. So, and you're, you know, some percentage of that, so, you know, let's say you need 12 that's a lot of money. And sure, maybe you want to build one gigafactory first, but then come out and say it, right? Don't just say, they're coming soon. Like, where? Built how? In what factory? And what batteries? And, you know, we're not just picking on VW. Right. I know a lot of our German viewers are constantly like, why are you picking on VW all the time? Uh, we pick on American companies. Let's pick on Ford, for example. Yes. So, uh, And let's just get it right from the horse's mouth here. So here's Ford CEO Jim Hackett. He's talking to Poppy Harlow of CNN Business. And uh, let's just... Let's hear from him a few things that uh, he wants to say. The heads of Lyft and Uber have not been shy about saying they don't want any of us to own cars. Will Ford be selling cars and trucks in 20 years? Will he be selling rides? No, absolutely we will be selling cars and trucks and other kinds of products because the future disruption is not coming from rides. We already have them today. We already have rides today, so the disruption's different that's coming. Wait, the future disruption is not coming from rides? No, because... So is Lyft wrong? Is Uber wrong? The key, and there's, there's power in the Uber and the Lyft, and Didi's the Chinese version of that, in that they can use autonomy to make the cost of taxis go down, mm -hmm. but so can your teenage daughter have a better chance of not being in a bad accident, having and owning a vehicle that has all that intelligence. <laughs> Man, I, I'm sorry. He's just missing a top hat, a monocle, and a cigar. And he is exactly what you would picture. Like, Google, real quick, like, Google fat cat. And then guy, because you don't want a picture of cats. But, you know, like, the classic, like, fat cat with the big cigar, the top hat, and, the, like, the monocle or the glasses or the, or the whatever. And, he's, you know, he looks exactly like that. All right, so wait, wait, whoa. <laughs> Ride is not the disruption. 
Now, even Poppy was shocked by this. Yeah. I, because I think she was like, wait, did you hear? Did you not hear my question or something? Um, so he didn't say what the disruption is, except he somehow pivoted to say that Ford will make an autonomous car that your daughter will safely be in. That didn't make any logical sense r- really at all. He's like, oh, yeah, they're going to make taxi rides cheaper. But you still want your daughter to be safe in a car that has all of the same technology. It's like, yeah, she but it could be in a car with all of the same intelligence. It would just be that car that we had mentioned previously, the autonomous driving taxi right. that we had mentioned he, before. He somehow just willed it to be that, no, in 20 years, we'll still be making cars that people want to buy. And you'll want to put your daughter in one of our cars. And it's like, yeah, you'll want to put her in a car that, why do you need to own that car? Right. So she's going to be going somewhere. And then the car is going to drop her off. Great. And then it's going to go park in a parking lot park lawn? and then it's gonna sit there and, w- and be wasted opportunity for right like, it, oh it, it's like that's what we have today it's like if you had a factory but you only used it when you wanted a thing you're like oh i need a pencil let me just go <laughs> oh great ding you know there's my 12 pencils excellent i'll just be on my way and leave my factory here but again that's i think he's really he went to some school for this where they teach you how to pivot and not answer the question let's see this next part you guys are working on an electric f-150 and there's this great video that just came out of the truck actually pulling a freight train a million pounds i wonder if you wanted elon musk to see that just maybe well, he said, um, he said he was working on a truck that could tow 300,000, so we thought, well... Just like a million. Well, it's a million. And then we went above that, as you know. <laughs> All right, so to that question, I mean, let's be honest to what it was. Yeah, it's a, it's a <laughs> measuring contest. Yeah. To just be like, well, my truck's more powerful than Elon Musk's because I pulled a million tons on a train, which Could- has very low rolling resistance, and it was on perfectly level ground. I mean, it, it was a million pounds. I'm not going to... Or more... Because they put the trucks on it. I saw the commercial, but Hackett just focused on one small aspect of a truck um, as if you're going to want to tow a train. Like, right. Uh, why do you buy a truck, sir? Well, I was thinking in case I come across a train on the track <laughs> uh, blocking right. the road, yeah. I would like to be able to tow it. So Elon Musk, for his part, said, and I quote, there's a good chance that Ford doesn't make it in the next recession. Makes you smile, lights a fire, I'm sure. He's claiming their truck is going to be as powerful as yours, but it's going to drive like a Porsche 911. What tells you Tesla and Elon Musk won't win? Well, let, let's let's balance that because it meets the criteria of what we talked at the beginning, which is there's a disruptor coming. I happen to compete with a rocket scientist who's really smart, and I respect that about him. And yet, he's competing with the ultimate disruptor in Henry Ford. Does, does he not? Does he not know that Henry Ford is, is dead? Yeah, I don't think Does he, he not know that? I don't think he knows that. Because he's like wicked dead. He's yeah. been dead for like 70 years. Yeah. So when you go seven miles from here and you see the Rouge complex, Henry bet the company, he goes bankrupt. Yeah. Because there's no industrial model in the world that has 100,000 people working in it. That one did. And he took what took 12 hours to build a vehicle before he built it, went down to 52 minutes. Today we build an F-150 every 53 seconds. Wow. So let's go back to the challenges of the disruptor. How well was their production system working? You know, how fast were they building cars? Which is saying that fitness, as we were saying, is a, is a, a compendium of things that you have to get right. It's not just the technology in this mm-hmm. case. We have to have an industrial model. Ford's really good at this. Yeah, so let me get this straight. <laughs> you get asked about innovation and disruption. Yeah. And your answer is that, oh no, we are the kings of disruption here. Right. Because we the founder of our company, Henry Ford, have you heard of him? Right. He was he a great disruptor. Was an amazing disruptor. This would be the this would be like if we're like we're so worried about the future of America, and we're like, don't, don't worry. George Washington. Ever heard of him? Ever Great heard general. Of him? Yeah. You're missing something here. He's not here. He can't fix the problem. And even if he was here, he would just be like, what? What is the meaning of this? Henry Ford bet the company on a huge factory to build cars. 
But it sounds like that sounds super familiar. It's familiar. It's like Where did I there's hear? another guy who's like bet his whole company on a big factory, like a big, big It's called big like a gigafactory. Gigafactory. That's right. right. Oh, it's Elon Musk. Yeah. You're basically you just told the story of Elon Musk, except in the past, right. and you're like, well, because of that guy, we're gonna be fine. It's like, dude, he's dead. He's not gonna. He's not here to help you yeah, unless and, like his ghost is gonna come visit you and be like. Switch to electric cars. The, the word battery didn't come up once during this conversation. <laughs> no. And yet we're talking about trucks and cars that need batteries in them. And he throws the, around the word disruption as if it could mean anything. Right. As but, if, and and as also, but he doesn't invented a word. He doesn't understand that that ride is disruption. Right. He threw that out. No, that's not disruption. No, no, no. Those no. are taxis. Taxis. That's the disruption. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. It's going to disrupt the taxi market, of course. So, I mean, Henry Ford, back in his day, put humans on the line, uh, right. gave them each a job. 100,000 100, workers in one spot. And that, that was unheard that's of. That's exactly what Jim Hackett was talking right. about. Right. I mean, no one had heard of this way of building before. It was mm -hmm. a great, you know, innovative idea. They give each person a very specific job. They can do it super fast, super well. And then the car gets built super duper fast. It's good for efficiency. Right. I'll, good in general, I don't know. Oh, right. Okay. But, like, in terms of making cars, it's yeah. a very efficient way to do it. Along comes Elon Musk with this idea of a machine that will build a machine. So uh, eventually an alien dreadnought factory that will be all automated. Now, it's not in place yet, but he got laughed at by all the big car manufacturers because it's like, oh, how many, how many Model 3s did you build with your alien right. dreadnought? But he's trying for the same innovation that Henry Ford tried right. for. Elon has patents coming out of his ears. He has patents that we've told you about of, you know, taking a giant machine that will go <laughs> and make the frame of a car. Right. All, you know, 70 pieces reduced to one. Right. Like that's innovation. And Elon has said before that he releases all of his patents uh, to the car industry. That is not 100% true. It's enough patents to make right. basically a Model S, right. which is no other company has done yet. So apparently no one has taken him up on that offer. But so those patents are there. Like if they wanted to make an electric car that was sweet, they could do it. Exactly. But autonomy and a lot of the different manufacturing processes, that's still Tesla's patents. They're not even using t the knowledge that Tesla's of given course. them. They're partnering with companies that are clueless and trying to figure it out like from scratch yep. and not accomplishing it. And I think this is funny. Uh, Hackett keeps falling back on the speed with which they can produce a Ford F-150. Mm -hmm. um, as if there's a factory that he owns that in 53 seconds you can start with a block of steel and at, out the other end in 53 seconds later would come a Ford F-150. They do not have such a factory. No. What he's saying is if you take all of our factories around the world and you count the number of cars that are coming out every day, it averages a truck every 53 seconds. Right. That's because they have so many factories because they're a giant car manufacturer that's been around for over 100 years. Right. But being that large a size does not mean that you have a huge advantage no. when you need to change. Exactly. Um, because that means that all of those factories need to change. And, you know, it's fine if you're, like, adding a new cup holder. It's like, okay, we planned for that. And next year we're going to have a new cup holder or it's going to be a slightly larger kind of touchscreen. But if you want to switch to a completely new technology like electric cars, you're not going to be able like that's that is a completely different ball game. Right. When you're putting out uh millions of cars a year and you then have to put batteries in those cars which you do not have and cannot manufacture, then how many cars a second are you going to put out? I could imagine the CEO of Kodak back in the day being like, "We make a roll of film every second." Right. Like <laughs> Don't worry, we're gonna be here forever. Digital cameras. Yeah. When was the last time you bought film? When was the last time you saw a film canister? No, Remember really... how that was like, oh, just put it in a film canister. Like, That's a really good point. Every... Now you have to go somewhere to buy a film canister. Every motion picture I saw for decades said, filmed on Kodak film at the end. Right. And everyone said, there's never gonna be a day when you'll watch a film that won't be filmed on film. There's no way you can make it look that they way. They even called it film. Right. They just were they, so confident. There'll always be a film camera. Now, maybe you'll change it to digital at the end, mm -hmm. but it, you'll always shoot it on Kodak film. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just not true anymore. Not true. The only innovation that Ford has at the moment is this little startup company they just invested in called Rivian. Have you heard of them? Yes. And that wasn't mentioned in Hackett's thing at all. He didn't say, and you know, we're so smart at Ford because we keep our eyes open for the young startups with a lot of brains mm -hmm. and we invest our money in them. No. He made it sound like Ford had made this Ford F-150 all by their lonesomes. Right. They bought Rivian and then seconds later 
started shooting that marketing that we saw oh, with exactly. the train. I mean, that yeah. was literally, as I said before, it had to have been days after they put the money into Rivian. I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, or as fast as they possibly could. Right. Right. Because it's not like they were talking about anything in that Ford F-150. It's not like they were like, oh, and the seats are like this, and the screen is like this, and the this or the, anything to do no. with the interior or the exterior. It was just, this has an electric powertrain. Also, do you notice... No mention of the fact that electric is good for the environment and how it's great for the global warming crisis because we're helping in that regard. Right. You know why they can't say that? Because they're not. Even if they started, even if they were 49% electric car manufacturer, right. um, the 51% would still be, you know, they would maybe be neutral in terms of, you know, the vehicles that they were putting out. It wouldn't so It's so matter. weird for them to make a product where they can't even talk about the most important parts of that product. Right. I think that he should have couched this as a learning experience. He should have said something like, you know, I actually went for a test ride in a Model 3 and I was actually very impressed. And I realized that, you know, this... And, and he wouldn't even have to say Model 3. He could say, I took step foot in the Rivian and I was so impressed. I was like, wow, this is definitely the future of trucks. Um, I knew that I had to get on board with this, so I, I said, we need to acquire this company because they've got the brains. And, you know, being a big company, we well, don't know. You know, just be honest. Well, there's the thing. They haven't acquired the company. It's not like the company has been enveloped into Ford. Mm. It's still its own company. Right. He cannot mention it because it's going to compete against them still. That's the weirdest thing about this. Wow. You know, so they weird. didn't even do it right. They didn't even just buy the company outright. Right. They're in there with Amazon and Ford. Rivian was super smart. They've got enough money from both so that they're still their own company. Mm. So that's why you're not going to hear Ford talk about Rivian. Um, let's see this next clip. Does, does he keep you up at night, Elon Musk? Well, I like to make the threat of disruption, the, the boogeyman. And it can come from everywhere. There's one part of your brain that says, let's rationalize that it's not as good as it might be. So the railroad's really not going to interrupt the Pony Express. Look at our market share. Right. I go the other way and say, what's great about the way they're thinking about their products? And it's not just Amazon or Tesla. You know, we pick more fit ideas. So one of the things we've instituted at Ford is a thing called Curious Minds, which means, like the table, we will inv invite the smartest people in the world to come in and tell us what they're doing yep. so that we can derive from that how we might mm -hmm. use that capability. The question was, does he stay up at night? And again, he didn't answer the question. I was such I, a, I mean, is that a pivot? Is that a misdirection? I well, don't it's even just, know what you it's call beautiful. It. It's, po it's political <laughs> speak. He should run for office. I mean, this is exactly what uh, American politicians do, right? That's They're true. really good at not answering the question. And then you walk away going, I think he's so smart. I don't know why I think that <laughs> because I don't even know what he said. Right. Um, what is a fit idea? A fit idea? It's an idea that works out a lot. I mean, it a fit idea? idea i don't know i'm sorry uh, have i missed the english language boat on this one is this some new phrase it must be a detroit phrase because you know i'm in the uh you know high tech uh lingo market and i don't hear fit ideas and then okay is ford the pony express or the railroad in that example i think that he actually meant that ford was the pony express which is not a good, like, just a little history lesson. The Pony Express was like, you yeah. could mail something across the country in the United States, and, like, a guy would ride a pony, and then he would hand off the, your letter to another guy in a pony, and he would ride it, you know, and they would keep doing that all the way across the country. And then the railroad came in, and pfft, in two days, right. the Pony Express was disbanded because no one wanted to, you know, do that. But, I mean, I watched it three times, and I think he was siding with the Pony Express. So he, what he's saying is that, Ford is the Pony Express, yep. and that they shouldn't look at it like they have a lot of market share, which is true. I agree. Yes, that's a good point. You shouldn't just assume that since you have all this market share that you're in the lead. But then he goes like, he just pivots away from that. Right. And then he just again implies that they will get all this great these great ideas from outsiders that will come and share it to them mm -hmm. freely. Um, even though Ford is obviously not listening to these disruptive ideas. There's plenty of good ideas floating around. The idea of a good CEO is that he or she already knows where the company should go. Not that they're going to just sit sit around and wait for some bright ideas to come along in, right. in some 
uh, you know, we're going to have a Curious Mind session this afternoon. Would you like to come take everyone, a listen? Everyone is invited down to the conference room. We're going to have a Curious Mind session. Bring your notepads Bring with you. you. Uh, like, yeah, you want a CEO who's a leader, who's like, we're doing this. And if you aren't going to do that, you're going to get out of my way because right. that is what we're doing. This is the direction we're headed. Right. And you're either headed in the right direction or you're not. We, uh, we can't show these Curious Minds sessions. I, I encourage you to Google it. Very hard to find. But basically, think of like a TED Talk, but done at, at like a high school. Um, <laughs> I think that's sort of the... You know, yeah. I think that they had some pretty impressive people, but it's just not, you're not going to get out of it that you should, like, be making serious business decisions. I think that you're just going to be like, hmm, well, synergy. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, it, it's acting as if uh, when you go to, like, Thanksgiving and your grandfather tells you something you've known for 10 years. Like, right. have you heard of these things called TED Talks? Right. They're really kind of smart. Really a lot of fit <laughs> ideas in there. I mean, I just want to mention that, you know, if he's going to bring up Ford, mm -hmm. Ford was innovative in his day. And, in fact, Citroën and Peugeot and Toyota, they all visited Ford's factory to find out how he did things. And then they copied him because right. it was a great idea for auto manufacturing. Right. But what Hackett is implying is that they're not going to look to Tesla for inspiration no. like these, you know, like Citroën and Peugeot did. Um, they're just going to ignore that upstart because I don't know what the heck they're doing over there. They right. can barely make any cars. He's able to come out there and be like, we're making this electric Ford. Not mention when they're going to make it. Not mention what, you know, where they're going to be making well, it. He where, says, where he's getting the batteries from. He says for the next 20 years, you know, you're going to be buying our cars. <laughs> right. And it's, um, I'm sorry. No, you're not. And you might be saying like, whoa, this is a wake up call to me. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I understand if you're confused. We have a whole series dedicated to talking about our autonomous driving future, where basically all the cars on the road are going to be driving themselves and hardly anyone's going to be owning them. It's right. just going to be like, it's just a service. But yeah, he's able to just be like, no, nope, that's not what it's gonna, the future's going to be. It's going to be that you're buying cars from us. Now, I think that he might know that that's not the future. Right. But he can't say it because their whole business model right. is making so many cars and making them kind of crappy. Exactly. So that way you need to buy a new one every once in a while. Right. And like, pay a lot for service. That's the business model. Right. And he's also acting like they have decades to come up with the answers. Oh, well, you know, we'll figure something out with this Tesla thing. Don't right. you worry. We're going to win in the end. And that's the soon fallacy. Right. It's like, yeah, we'll do it soon. We'll clean up the room. Don't worry. Right. We're going to pick up. It's it's like, first of all, you have to clean up, pick up the your room, which like the world, the whole world is dying because you have, you know, dragged your feet on this. It's just, it's so sickening and insane. But when I hear VW or Ford say that they want to go into EVs and they want to go into autonomous, I really do get excited. And I did when I first read these articles because it, this is what Elon wants. He wants this transition to happen as soon as possible. And so do I. I don't care about... You know, I'm not, I'm agnostic when it comes to the companies. Like, I hope it is mm -hmm. all of these companies. Mm -hmm. But then when I peel back the headlines and I listen to what they're really saying, and I realize that they're clueless and they're way behind, that's when I get really upset because they're just paying us lip service. And if they truly got it, you would see it in their financial reports. You would see big investments in batteries. Huge investments. Exactly. Unprecedented investments. And in fact, shareholders would be saying like, oh my gosh, why, why are you investing so much right. in batteries? There should be pushback from investors. The exactly. investors should be saying, whoa, what's going on? And right. they should be saying, you need to read up, buddy. There's a, there's a storm coming. There's a change right. coming. The winds of change are coming. But instead, they're partnering either with companies that are just as clueless as they are, right. or they're putting some money into Cruise or Argo or Rivian, you know, companies that they should be working with, but that is just the tip of the iceberg of where they need to be. Right. I think one of the reasons why these CEOs don't get it is because they've never gotten into a Tesla and actually taken it for a drive for more than, I would say, probably 10 minutes. Right. And, and it was probably hidden behind some Ford building somewhere and they're on their private test track. And uh, so, you know, Jim Hackett, he got in the car and he put it in drive and he drove it around a little bit. And then he got out and he's looking out at his employees. And he, what has he got to say? It doesn't matter what he thinks. He's got to be like, man, it's a piece of crap. Well, let's get back to the truck building business, right? You can't, like, even if you were impressed with the acceleration and the handling, even if you were like, oh, it's really nice and quiet in here, you can't say any of that because you're the CEO of right. Ford. And you especially can't go on what I think is the most important thing, especially with Teslas, 
And that is road trips. Yeah, because let's be honest, this is groundbreaking technology. Mm -hmm. You need to spend more than 10 minutes with it to understand it. In fact, I would argue that most people have to spend about a week with it at least doing a lot of driving before you fully appreciate what you're getting. And to, to that point, I would like to read from a blog post of one of our viewers, uh, which really touched me a lot. Mm -hmm. This is from our buddy Somi. And she said, it's here, day 100. I'm in love with my Tesla even more than on day one. It's incredible. I'm pretty sure on day 100 of my Honda ownership, I was already bored with the car. Well, the adventures are far from over. Last night, I planned out my four and a half week road trip and here it is, I am beyond excited. This thing I feel that has developed over these last 100 days is unfamiliar to me. People call it wanderlust. I call it liberation. Essentially, all my life, I have craved living in reclusion. Even when I traveled around the world and was that wild gal who planned incredible trips and events nonstop, I always looked forward to being alone. So every decade, when I had a complete mental breakdown, I disappeared into my place. Nobody saw me for months on end. I stopped answering my phone. It would take me a couple of years to even figure out how to come out and meet people again. Major depression has been my closest friend and worst enemy since I was a child. Now, before it looks like Tesla cured me, I need to emphasize that I went through and continue to go through years of counseling. I worked hard to break my mental habits and to find a way to grow into my own self, but I've always sought being alone. In fact, I feel the best when I'm alone. I'm never bored, never lonely. I like it. But I noticed since getting my Tesla, I never want to be home. I don't know what this is, but now I understand why people love to travel. The last eight weekends, I take off to somewhere new and exciting. I research sites to see and just go. Sometimes I take people with me, sometimes I go alone. As long as I'm driving somewhere, I am happy. I mentioned that on my way back from my first trip to Portland, I began to cry. I realized that this trapped feeling I felt all my life, this powerless feeling of being controlled, took another big step out of my life. This car, this thing that Tesla has made, has deinstitutionalized decades of trauma. I have been working so much on being mentally free, but now I am physically free. I go where I want and I'm not paying for it from my wallet or from my mental fitness. I just go for however long I want and arrive like I had just been teleported there instantly. No tired body, no tired mind. My boundaries of existence have just been expanded far beyond what I had ever imagined. I'm not familiar with this feeling and all I know to do is feed it. And so I am going to drive for four and a half weeks, most of the time on the road, and just enjoy. Cheapest therapy on earth. This was extremely powerful for me to read because it's basically exactly what Zach and I went through um, when Zach got Sparky. Because, um, you know, we had had an electric car to putz around in. Uh, we were driving around in the I-3, which could go 60, 70 miles on electric. And we didn't want to drive it in gas mode. But once we got Sparky, which, who could go 260 miles, it was a huge difference. And we were just, we would just end up places. Right. We would, oh, we made it to Provincetown at the end of Cape Cod. Which I don't think. Well, it, I want to stress. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've lived in Massachusetts my whole life and uh, I never went to Provincetown that way. It really is so liberating. You're just like, oh yeah, I just want to go there. And you can you have the supercharger networks to get you there and it just is so freeing you have autopilot which means that when you get there you're not exhausted there were some days on our cross-country road trip where we traveled 800 miles and we you know 16 hour days of driving non-stop practically and we would get to the hotel and we wouldn't be that tired and here's the thing, if you are an employee of VW or Ford or GM, you need to get your CEO to do this. Tell them, look, this is going to be a major car competitor of yours, right? So you might as well get to know this car. Put a disguise on, don't let anyone know it's you, and go for a one-week road trip in this car. Then come back and lead this company. Right. And if you still think that this is the way you want to lead the company by putting your head in the sand, then at least you've had the experience. But I'll bet you anything... If you get your CEO to do that, they will change direction. And I think what really happened with the German companies is that this sort of happened where basically there was this explosion of Model 3s in Germany um, where just at their headquarters, they were just able to look out the window and be like, that's a Model 3, that's a Model 3, that's a Model 3. We, did, we didn't think this was going to happen. Right. But in Detroit, 
It's in Michigan, and yeah. Michigan doesn't allow people to directly buy from Tesla. Right. So it's this huge pain just to buy a Tesla in Michigan. So in Detroit, and it's also Detroit. It's an oddity. You're not going to see a lot of Model 3s. No, I mean, we've heard from Bob Lutz. He even wrote an article about it where he bumped into a Tesla in a parking lot. He didn't drive it. He just saw it. Right. And that alone was earth shaking for him just right. the way it was it built just from the, the outside it looked right but here's a guy he doesn't even work for gm anymore he's allowed to drive in a tesla mm -hmm. if he wants to and he didn't right that's because they're so insulated from the world that they don't even want to experience what we're experiencing yeah that's that's why when we talk about tesla with such like confidence it's because of experiences like this that we've had that i know that uh, just the tiniest tiniest minority of people have seen right because we, we hear about it every week right. every week on the show why do you think we share with you experiences on community mail time mm -hmm. it's one of the most important parts of tesla time news right. we want you to see that everyone who experiences tesla has the same experience as we do and i promise you this if someone writes to me and says i just bought a mazda zach and i'm so excited and i want to tell the community about it i'll put it on there Right. No one tells me that. <laughs> it's true. There's another really big point, though, I want to make. A lot of people are writing to us and saying, well, I do think there's a demand problem, Zach and Jesse. Here's the thing. Yeah. There's no other product I can think of in this price range that mm -hmm. sells itself like a Tesla does. Yeah. I mean, you remember some products in the day, like when the iPhone came out. It sold itself. You walked around, you showed your friends, and they're like, oh, what's that? I want one of those. Here, it's the Zippo app. And you're just like, wow, it's like a real lighter, but it's not real. Holy crap. <laughs> I gotta get I one of those. I need that. Exactly. This is basically the same idea. It's yep. such an amazing product that you don't need an advertisement for it. There's people like Somi who are relating what's happening in their lives. And when you hear it, if you're a friend of hers, for instance, you'd go, oh my gosh, this car got her to do that in her life? Right. That's amazing. Right. I need to check this out. Right. I need to talk to her about it. Yeah. And I mean, that's what we're all about here is talking about this amazing transformation that we have. And like this could have happened earlier. OK, Elon Musk could have sat down in a in a restaurant and with with uh, J.B. Strobel and wrote some napkin calculations down. They could have done that two, three years earlier, and we could have had the same cars in just about the same amount of time. Right. And so we would be two or three years in the future. Like it was just that it's not like it's some breakthrough technology right. happened. They put laptop batteries in a car. Yep. And it was amazing, and it's still amazing today. And they used a motor that was designed by Nikola Tesla 100 years ago. Right. This change is going to happen because you are going to go and talk to your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers about the change that's happening around you. You are the one who's going to spread this. It's not going to come from any place else. It's going to be grassroots. It's going to come up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so it's super important that you share these experiences, whether you share this video or you share your own experiences by getting people to put butts in seats in your car, whatever you have to do to tell one other person at least about it, because that's how we spread the message. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us this week and every week here on In Depth. We're gonna see you next week. Now you know.